Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Banker Next Door podcast. I am your host, Dr. Joe Berquist. Today, I've got a great interview lined up for us. We're going to be talking with Mr. Kent Kirby from Abrigo, and I'm very excited about this because this is a topic near and dear to my heart, which is loan automation. Uh, we'll get into it in a minute when we we talk to, uh, to Mr. Kirby here. But uh, my dissertation, when I was going through and getting my doctorate, was actually on uh, doing automating the small business loan process in community banks. And Abrigo was actually my sponsor for my dissertation. So I reached out to them and asked them if they'd be willing to get somebody to come on with me and just kind of have a discussion, uh, you know, kind of a general topic about what Abrigo does and just a little bit more in depth about loan automation. And uh, so with that, I'm going to bring on our guest today. Uh, Mr. Kent Kirby is with us. How are you doing today, sir? Good afternoon. I'm doing fine. Thank you very much. Great. Excellent. So, uh, Kent, could we kick off today and just could you probably just tell us a little bit about Abrigo and what Abrigo does? Sure. So Abrigo is actually two companies in one. Uh, it was it was formed by a merger of Bankers Toolbox, which primarily deals with anti-money laundering and BSA and SageWorks, which primarily deals with uh, credit decisioning and processing, which is probably more where you came from. And, and, and the, the uh, Banker's Toolbox bought a Bre uh, SageWorks, but they branded it a Brigo. And since then, they bought several other companies, including Dicom Software, which was a loan review automation software, which is how I came into it. Uh, I, I'm a retired banker. Um, but when I retired, I became sort of the resident banker at DICOM, and then I moved over to Rigo when they bought us earlier in January. Um, so that's that's really in a nutshell. The thing that's uh, I think somewhat unique about Abrigo is it really caters more to community banks. It will it has a large number of big banks, but let's say over 10 billion. I'm going to make that arbitrary cutoff of 10 billion. But their sweet spot really is community banks, and they really understand their customers, which are different than the bigger banks. I came from a bigger bank background, and, and it's just different, and, and they get it. And so I think that while it works very well for any bank, and community banks in particular would find the Brigo product uh, very um, useful. Nice. Very nice. Um, so if we can get into loan automation here for a second. So could you talk a little bit about what you feel the benefits of loan automation are? Like, in other words, why would a bank want to automate a loan process? Well, and, and you know, you're, you're, you've got the doctorate. I've just got the experience. <laughs> and, and, and I will tell you that you're an idiot if you don't want to automate. And, and, I'm, and, and I'm, I'm not very diplomatic, but I've never was paid to be a diplomat. So I'm not going to be one now. And, and two things. Number one um, is, and every bank has it. I don't care if you're a $100 million bank or a $100 billion bank, but everybody in your bank has a real job, for the lack of a better term, that, a job that you're being paid for, a job that is your job description, if you will. And everybody has National Guard jobs. And those National Guard jobs are sort of these extras. Nobody really can, you know, they're not pinned down anywhere, so people just pick them up. And they take a lot of time. So just as an example, uh, covenant tracking. Somebody's got to do it. And chances are, if you're not automated, you're doing it on an Excel file. That means a junior lender is probably doing it because they understand what they're doing. And so you got a junior lender who you're paying whatever you're paying for to do loans. And they're spending 80% of their time doing loans, but they're spending 20% of their time covenant tracking. That's the kind of stuff that this National Guard stuff that I'm talking about. So you have all this sort of extraneous stuff that could get picked up in an automation program and, and just make everybody more efficient and start doing their job. The second is in doing their job, ten, people tend to be inefficient as well. My own experience has been is that, you know, people, um, you get kind of in a happy path, if you will, and it may not necessarily be the most efficient way to doing it. And so, for example, you got a $100,000 loan and a million dollar loan and a $10 million loan. And, and you do them both, all three, pretty much the same way. You know, you write a, a nice write up and all that kind of stuff. And, and you spend two or three days on it because that's what you like to do. But, you know, you're going to make 3000 bucks on your $100,000 deal. You're not going to make any money on it. And so <clears throat> having an automation program helps you with the efficiency of doing your core job as well as trying to get all this sort of National Guard stuff um, off the table and, and into some uh, a framework that can be dealt with more efficiently. 
Would it be, uh, Kirby, would it be fair to say that some of the other things would be your, you know, again, like you alluded to, you're going to have increased efficiency, you're going to have reduced turnaround time, uh, mm -hmm. but then you're also have the ability to potentially reduce your underwriting costs. For oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, again, I don't want to go into, I mean, you can, you wrote the dissertation, but I could talk it. Okay. <laughs> and, and so, I mean, you know, again, it gets back to my point. Why do you want to spend 60, 70 pages on a million dollars, a hundred thousand dollar loan? You know, you need one <laughs> and, and you don't need to go in and do one of these in the beginning memos. You know, it's, it's not, it, you don't need to do all that. You don't have to drop neutron bombs to kill ants. And, and I think because we, we have this sort of happy path. That's the approach we take with everything. And, and I think with the automation program can really say, look, this is a hundred million dollar deal. I'm going to put you in the big path. This is a hundred thousand dollar deal. I'm going to put you in the little path. And, and so when you go through these things, cause a lot of these things are more kind of question and answer decision tree type of, 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 of operations. Um, you're going to have to spend less time because you don't have to answer as many questions. You know, I don't care if you, you know, what you did in 2018. I just want to give you a hundred thousand dollar loan. And so it, it just makes you, it, it, it reduces the amount of stuff that you have to do based on the size and complexity of the deal. Nice. Um, so let me ask you this question. If you, if a bank did want to automate a loan process, could you mm -hmm. kind of walk us through the implementation process of that? Like, how would that, how would that go? Yeah, the, you know, the, and, and and so the implementation process is more of a ritual than anything else. Um, it's it, it's really the stuff around the implementation process, which it's it's a much more involved thing. But but the implementation process and these things are all clouds, so you're not going to have to install software on anything. You're going to get access to a cloud. They're going to put they're going to create an environment, and they're going to send you a log on information, and you're in. Then the real trick is, is you got to figure out what to do with it when you're in it. Cause you're basically, it's not a blank slate, but it's, it's, it's a template, if you will. And you got to fill out the template and you got to start making decisions. You know, what kind of a risk rating system do you want? What, what do you want on the underwriting? What are the criteria? What are the criteria for a hundred thousand dollar loan versus a million dollar loan? There's a million decisions that you have to make when you're doing this. And so you'll have a project manager and you'll have an implementation or engineer or two. You'll probably have one for data and one for process. And they'll guide you through the steps. They would come from the vendor and they'll guide you through the steps. But the real trick is this is not a one person deal. So if you think you can just turn this over to Frank, the really smart lender, it ain't going to work. OK, it's got to be a task force and it's got to be a true task force. So if, who's doing your uh, closings? So is that if that's a if that's a secretary, they need to be involved. If it's a loan closer, they need to be involved. So it's not just bringing in all the SVPs or you know Frank doing it or whatever. You have to have a true task force because there's a lot of tough decisions that have to be made. That's what takes most of the time, and there's really nothing the vendor can do to help you because every bank kind of does things a different way, mm -hmm. and and so you have to kind of what's your risk appetite? If your risk appetite's for ABL loans. You're going to have a different framework than your risk appetites for you know straight cash flow or real estate loans. So it's it just kind of depends on the bank. No, and I think that's a great point, Kirby. And I, I so <clears throat> one of the things I've tried to explain to some of the people I've talked to about this that that are you know at some banks that are thinking about doing this is that you know you have uh, you have to think about it like this: you've got multiple departments that are going to be touching this. I mean, everybody from accounting, credit, lending. Uh, maybe even potentially retail, depending on what you're doing, if you're doing consumer right. loans versus business loans, that kind of thing. But it's it really is a team effort across multiple departments. And just like you said, like you're, you're not going to bring in one person and just have them run this thing. It, it's, it's it's a team effort. You got to have a team doing it that's coordinating amongst all these departments and kind of bringing it all together. Um let me ask you this: If just from a time frame standpoint, just so if we could give somebody a general time frame, so you automate your, let's say you automate the small business loan process, uh, what what kind of time frame do you think they're looking at to accomplish that? Six months, nine months, a year? Like what do you what do you think? I would say realistically nine months to a year, and I would say okay. for two reasons. First of all, number one is whatever you're doing today, you're not going to do tomorrow. I'm sorry, you're just not because you're not going to have all that extra stuff. And you're going to have to have to sit down and really have some hard conversation about what's important and what's not important. And, and the other thing is, is quite frankly, 
as you move through this, it's not one variable changing. It's a lot of variables changing at the same time. And so what happens is, is that you make one decision and it boomerangs through, <laughs> through the, I'm, I'm saying, I'm laughing because I'm speaking from experience, but you, you know, you make one decision and it boomerangs through and now all of a sudden you got to make some decision. And so things change quite a bit mm -hmm. and, and, and you're not going to, it's not going to be, well, if I do this, everything's going to happen. If I do this, then it's kind of, it kind of fans out. So it takes about nine months to a year um, to, to get it where you want it to be. And then I guarantee you that you're going to be making some adjustments for the next year afterwards. I mean, once you've gone live, you're going to be making adjustments. Um, so, but, but the implementation process, the implementation is, is an hour. I mean, turning on the software is an hour, literally. It's the, it's the work around it. And that's going to take about nine months to a year. Okay. No, and I think that's a perfect segue to the next question, which is: so as you're going through this, uh, what are some of the what are some of the hurdles in the loan automation process, kind of like during and after implementation? And you you kind of alluded to some of them, but but what do you, what do you think are some of the other things that people might might be thinking about or should think about? Two, and 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 the first thing is is that you aren't going to be doing things the way you did them. Get used mm -hmm. to it. Get over it. And, and I mean, and, and so you really need to sit down at a two stage process before you ever touch the software, you need to go through everything that you do in booking and loan. And I'm talking about from, from the call report, right on through the underwriting process, through the booking, through the, the monitoring, you know, the post booking monitoring, every single step of that you need to go through just on your own pretend like you didn't buy anything, just go through that. And is it efficient? And, and, and are we doing it? Why are we doing it? And if the answer comes back, because it's always the way we've done it, then you throw it out. Or if you can, it takes more than about six seconds to figure out why you're doing it, you throw it out. And so you got to be kind of ruthless on this. And so um, that process has to happen first, in my opinion, and that's going to take a couple of months. It's, this is not something you can set up a meeting and bring in lunch and you're done. It's going to take a while because you kind of really got to go through this and you need to a core team, this core task force, but they're doing the interview process so they can, you know, somebody's got to be the referee and the judge and the executioner kind of all in one. And they've got to make some decisions on this efficiencies. That's the first thing you do. Then as you go through the, the process itself, you're going to be adjusting that, but at least you have a core of what you want to do. And, and I think that's where a lot of people mess up. They just kind of go in and say, well, we're going to kind of come in and, you know, what was it Muhammad Ali said, you know, uh, move like a butterfly and sting like a bee. It doesn't work like that. And, and you, you, need, to, you need to have an idea what your, your end state's going to be. You know, this is where I think it is, and I'll make some adjustments to it, but this is, you got to have an end state. That's the first big hurdles. People don't want to do that. It's hard. I mean, it's really hard because you're talking about changing your core, your core way of doing things. So I don't want to belittle that, but it's got to happen. The second and probably the biggest is data. And, and, and I would say two things about this. Number one, bankers have this prejudice that there's one source system. And that source system is as old as I am. And you can see the gray hair. I'm not young. <laughs> I can guarantee you that source system is old. It's also a transaction system, right? Because it's a loan accounting system. So it doesn't have all the bells and whistles you need. And, you know, quite frankly, I started banking in 1981. And a 1981 bank is totally different than a 2021, 2022, 2023 bank. They're, mm -hmm. they're totally different. It, it's, not even, it's not even a night and day thing. They're just totally different. And yet our source system, our loan accounting system is back from that era. And so what's happened is, is we've created all these source systems and these beautiful little islands called Excel files. And, but we pretend like they're not source systems, right? Because it's like, well, that's not the source system. Yes, it is. And so what you need to do is, is that your next source system, your second source system is this workflow solution. Because it can get you that stuff. It can get you the covenant tracking. It can get you the risk rating framework. It can do all that stuff for you. That's part of it. So get used to that. But then you've got to start building governance around that. And so what data is coming in from the source system? What data can I rely on from the uh, from the workflow solution that I'm using? That's that's tough because you've got to start then putting controls around. You know, you have all these controls around the transaction system. 
you got to build those same controls around this system as well. That takes some time as well. So it's not, like I said, flipping the switch is the easy part. <laughs> it's, 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 it's really, you know, how am I going to do it and what do I want to know? Um, yeah, it, it, you you get to a great point, Kirby. Uh, I, I, as you were talking, I was actually thinking about kind of another aspect of this when you, you know, we're talking about workflows and how you basically dissect the entire system and look at how every single part is going. To take that a step further, do you ever work with uh, the banks on what's called like value stream mapping? In other words, thinking about how is this going to affect the customer at the end of the day? What's the customer's journey as they go through this process from start to finish? And how are they going to feel as they go through this process? And how do they feel at the end once they've acquired, hopefully, their loan? Is that something that you guys think about when, when you're yeah, working absolutely. with the banks on this? Yeah, and I think that it absolutely is. And that's why it's important to have the lenders involved because I'm a credit guy. OK, I was a lender way back, you know, when you were still twinkling your, in your parents' eye. But I've been a credit guy all my life. And so credit guys don't care about people. I mean, that's, you know, that's mm -hmm. us. We're just kind of curmudgeons. And, and so we're going to build this system to do what we want it to do. And, and ultimately, this is sort of a credit system because that's really what it is. But the people that have got to use it are the people that that are the customer facing people and that's the mm -hmm. lenders. And, and if you're really forward looking and you've got some good customers that you would trust to be part of that process, I don't think that's a good idea. I think, I would imagine most people are like, Oh no, you don't want to do that. I think that's a good idea. Um, but at the very least you need to have some lenders and not just some credit guys pretending to be lenders, but I mean some lenders, some real customer facing customer advocating. I'll throw the bank under the bus before you, kind of people uh, as part of the task force, because they're going to be the ones that are going to, you know, what is the customer experience? So at a minimum, you need to have that on your task force. If you can, if you, if you have the courage uh, to get a couple of customers involved, I think that's great. Yeah, no, because it, it just gets to the <laughs> point at, at the end of the day of, you know, look, you could spend all the money you want and you could put this great system together, but if it doesn't ultimately deliver the experience you're looking for to the customer, then you've kind of wasted all your time right. in doing this. So it's just, like I said, I think that's an important aspect that a lot of times that bankers overlook when they're doing this is that they, and, and it's not till the very end that they sit there and go, oh, wait a minute. I don't know if this is really going to work that great for the customer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and the one thing I would say about this, <clears throat> I shouldn't say this because, you know, and as you can see from my name, I'm an advisor, but this is not something somebody can advise you on. OK, because everybody's mm -hmm. customer portfolio is unique. If you're dealing with a bunch of farmers in Des Moines, Iowa or you know, in Iowa, you know, they're going to have a different uh, worldview than if you're dealing with a, uh, real estate developers in New York City. And mm -hmm. so you really need to know what your customers are and who they are and what they expect. And I mean, everybody expects money, right? I mean, that's what we're in the business for. But at the end of the day, it's how you want to express that. And, 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 and that's really unique to each bank. And that's why I think it's so important to get some of these business development people involved in this process. Because they're going to, and they're going to buy into it more because they know they were part of it. That sort of serves two masters there, but it, it, it it's a, it's a thing. And I think it needs to happen. No, that's fantastic. Um, so let me uh, let let's kind of move on to a, a last couple things here real quick. So I wanted to ask you a little bit about your background. So you've kind of alluded that you've, you've been around for a little while. Uh, you had a, a background in banking. But could you could you tell us kind of how, like how did you end up working for a Brigo? How did like how did you kind of make your way through your career and ended up to this to this point? Yeah, well, I did. I became a banker just like everybody else did. I did something else other than banking and fell into banking. Um, so I'm actually an historian by training. And so my degrees and all that is history. And and but I worked in a small bank in my in my hometown. My dad was a director of it during the summers. This was back in the 70s when nobody could get jobs. And my mother was, you got to find this guy a job. I don't want him around the house. And so dad got me a job at the bank and I really got around to liking it. And I came a decision in about 1979 that it's a lot easier to read history than try to make a living on history. So I decided to become a banker. And so I went to got my MBA and then I started banking in 81 in Texas. So I was in Texas during the 80s. And okay. and I and I, I I found every scandal you could get a hold of. So 
I started when, and my first lending job was in Latin America. And so I had all the drug countries, Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, Bolivia. So that's where I started lending. And then of course the Latin debt crisis hit. And so then I went into workout Well, I spoke Spanish. And so ah, okay. I ended up going into loan review because they needed help because not only, I mean, you had all the international exposure, but we also, I mean, Texas has got a border, right? And so mm -hmm. we had a lot of banks down on the border. And so they needed somebody that understood what was going on. So I kind of went in there and then I went over to credit administration. Well, then Texas failed. I mean, <laughs> the whole state basically failed, but the bank failed. And, and the, the bank that bought it, uh, the bank that I failed at wanted me to go to work, but I would have to move somewhere else. And I'm originally from Southeast Kansas, but my family is originally from the Kansas City area. So I wanted to move back to Kansas City, so I, I moved there. And so I've been in, in Kansas City since 1988. And at the bank I was at, I started with Loan Review. They needed to have that kind of redone and reorganized. And then I moved into credit administration. I did that for about 10 years. I basically wet work, anything, all the dirty jobs is what I got to do. So I had to build a backroom function, things like that. And then I moved into portfolio management and then I moved into credit policy. So along the way, over 40 years, I've seen and done just about everything. And um, so it was a fun career. Uh, but then when I retired, <clears throat> so back in, I bought it uh, back in the, early, in the late 90s, uh, I was actually DICOM's first customer. And um, so uh, I'd always been part of their ecosystem, if you will. And then, and, and the CEO and I became good friends. And so when he, he always asked me, when you retire, what are you going to do? And, you know, the pandemic came along and boomers were retiring and I'm a boomer. So it was time to retire. And, and so I called Steve up and said, Hey, you're looking for a banker. And he said, Hey, I'm looking for a banker. So I went to work with Mike Dicom basically as the resident banker. And then Abrigo bought Dicom in January of this year. And I moved in with them. And then I've been moved over into the advisory services and the loan review, loan policy, I mean, the things that I do. So that's how I got to Abrigo. So, so I am not a, I'm not a consultant. I'm not a software guy. I'm just a curmudgeon, the old credit guy. And, and, and that's where I came from. No, I, I love it. I mean, that, I mean, I mean, Kirby, it sounds like you've had a, an amazing career and it sounds it was like you got a, a lot. Yeah. You sound like you got a lot of great stories there, which oh. I would love to probably dissect with you on another, another time when we've got, you know, we've got more time. Uh, but I think it's cool. I think it's so cool that, you know, Abrigo has, has someone such as yourself there that can provide that banking perspective, can kind of give them, um, uh, you know, just a lot of depth of knowledge about what's kind of going on in the banking industry over the last four, say 40 some odd years. And, uh, and that's, that's great. I mean, having somebody, I just think having somebody around like yourself is invaluable, especially when, you know, they're dealing with banks and they may wonder, you know, why is a bank willing to do this or not willing to do that? And, and just kind of get in the heads of, of some of the bankers and things like that. So, so it's good. No, it's great. It's, it's fantastic. So, now I bring ourselves some, I'm, I'm starting a little tradition here with all the people that I interview. And that is, uh, I love to ask them two questions at the end. What it, do you have a favorite business book or maybe, or maybe just a business book you have read recently that you really liked or you thought was good. And what is your favorite business related movie? Okay. I'm going to give you very off the wall answers because again, I'm not a business guy. I'm a historian that got stuck in the banking world. And so I don't like self-help books. Um, I, I think that those are just people looking to get money. I, I, I spent pretty much all my life and certainly all my career working under five basic principles. I haven't really needed to change them. I'm good. But what I do like are two things. Number one is I love things that change the world uh, and change how the world has acts. For example, the cotton gin in 1793 fundamentally altered the way the United States existed through the 19th century. So, so these, these, these activities that fundamentally change business. So the second is I always love a good scandal, especially financial scandal. I mean, I'm sorry. I just love them, right? My wife watches soap operas. I read financial scandals. And, and so I got both of them recently in a book called The Mysterious Case of Rudolph Diesel by Douglas Brunt. Yes and, yes. and it's a great book. I highly recommend it. So Diesel was born in the 1860s, somewhere in there, and he died in 1913, sort of. That's where the scandal comes in. 
and I don't want to give too much away because it's a good book, but diesel invented the diesel engine. And, 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 it, and, and, and you think it's something, you know, new or whatever it was. And it was invented like in the 1880s and, 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 and it was perfected over the years. And it really fundamentally changed logistics, right? Trains, mm -hmm. trucks, ships all run on diesel engines, but so do submarines. And that's really where it became a big issue because, you know, the Kaiser decided that he's not going to be able to catch up with Britain on the battleship front. So he's going to go after submarines. Submarines work real well with diesel engines. And so then the British got out. And so diesel goes disappeared, just disappeared off the face of the earth in 1913. And, and everybody's kind of like, where did he go? And so this guy comes up with a theory, which makes some sense. And, and, and again, it's speculation because we don't have a body. And um, so, but it's a good book. And I would highly recommend it just because of that. Yeah, no, I, I actually heard about that book. I actually saw an interview with the author uh, not too long ago, and it it, so it sounded like a fascinating book. Um, really kind of a lot of intrigue because it, it kind of got at the crossroad of kind of like politics, war, business. <laughs> it, it all it all kind of intersected it's all right there, there yeah. yeah, with this yeah. guy, which was which, yeah, it sounded like a, a great story. So, um, no, that's perfect. So thank you. Thank you for, for definitely recommending that. Um, if um, if you like a scandal, you might want to check out. I just did a movie review for a new movie that just came out called Dumb Money, and it's all about the GameStop uh, saga with oh, you know, just cool. just yeah, kind of yeah. yeah, like the the hedge how the hedge funds and everything got caught in a short squeeze and, and the retail traders and and how they were you know all you know kind of uh, working through Reddit and everything. So it was a you know pretty cool pretty cool story. A lot of a lot of people really really like that one. So yeah, I'll, I'll um, watch that. But uh, but yeah, so no, it, it, Kirby, I can't thank you enough. I really appreciate you coming on here with us. And and I definitely hope that, you know, again, I think what I was trying to do here with this interview is just trying to introduce the audience to Abrego and just try to introduce the audience to, to just kind of the, a general overview of, of loan automation. So I really do hope we can we can come back again and and maybe talk granularly about some some other aspects of loan automation at another point, which would be great. Yeah, anytime. I I thoroughly enjoy this. Like I said, as a historian, you're a frustrated professor, right? I mean, I should be at some obscure university in upstate Minnesota teaching history. And so uh, I love these kinds of things. So anytime, just give me a buzz and we'll chat. Perfect. No, thank, thank you so much for joining us again. So. <laughs> See you. All right. So again, I just want to thank uh, Mr. Kirby. I want to thank Abrigo for being willing to come on here onto the podcast and just talk to us a little bit about loan automation. I hope if if you know nothing about loan automation, I hope you learned a little bit uh, something today. It's definitely, like I said, a topic that's near and dear to my heart and something that we'll be talking a lot more about in 2024. It's definitely one of kind of the technologies that is uh, that it's kind of permeating through banking right now and uh, something that a lot of banks are if, if they're not if they haven't automated they're certainly experimenting with it or thinking about experimenting with it at this point so but thank you very much for 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 tuning in today uh, if you liked what you saw please give a big thumbs up make sure to subscribe to the channel if you have any comments please make sure to leave those below i'd be happy to get back to you and let you know uh you know just what's going on. Um, I will try to include some information if you'd like to get in touch with uh, Mr. Kirby or would like to get in touch with Abrigo. I'll make sure to, to put those into the uh, description section below. And uh, thank you again for uh, joining us today. And we'll be sure to get back to you again real soon.